Okay, let's do it. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you also to our panel uh, to make this event uh, work. For the uh, 23rd time, we have our flagship event, What's Hot, What's Not, 2022, where a group of venture capitalists and uh, M&A are talking about investment in edge computing, AI, and other components of an industrial IoT network. Now, everybody should know us. Uh, we are in place since 1994. Uh, our mission is, uh, oh, what is going back? That was not planned like this. Okay, we are connecting people, so we bring uh, community and uh, uh, connectivity and also knowledge education to the wireless world, worldwide, not only Silicon Valley. So a little bit uh, housekeeping here. Uh, please use the Zoom question and answer section for questions if you have. The presentation and the recordings will be available within 48 hours. Greetings again to the world and thanks for being our guests. And to speak or sponsor to us, please contact us at sponsor at wca.org. As mostly and always, we have a raffle upcoming in about um, one hour, 15 minutes or so. You will see me again, uh, where we raffle off a set of uh, grill barbecue gloves, which you protect, you protect you against hot heat when you barbecue, or if you're doing cold sake, like Bill will do in a few minutes right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially thanks to our sponsors like Aspil, uh, CRG, Google Energy, Wola, and so on, who make it work that our mission uh, will be continue for the next few years. And now, Lisa, I hand over to, over to you. Lisa is our moderator in the show since almost forever. And today we have the panel from Trisha, Henry, Bill, and Mark. And I think they will introduce themselves pretty soon. Lisa, with this, I'm quiet right now, and the show is yours. Thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone for joining today. As Peter mentioned, is the 23rd annual What's Hot, What's Not, and but WCA is put on. And uh, I think this has been, I think I've been doing this since 2015. I went to my email and it's been a long time. Um, so thank you to all of you um, who are here today for the first time and to those of you who are returning. Very excited to have an awesome panel. Uh, many of whom have been here before. And I'd like to start um, by first of all doing introductions and then we'll, we'll dive right into it. So I'm Lisa Oshima, I'm a management consultant. I specialize in business development strategy and marketing for tech clients, uh, specifically those in emerging tech. Um, I am gonna be passing off to Bill, who's gonna be the first person to introduce himself in the panel. Why, thank you, Lisa, and thank you for inviting me back. And it's great to be back with the um, annual What's Not, What's Not event. Um, always, always a fun time. Just so sorry that we're not all together in person, but this gives us broader reach and broader connections. So I guess there's that advantage. My name is Bill Reichert and I'm a partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures. Pegasus is a global venture capital firm based here in Silicon Valley and with offices around the world. We've got about $2 billion of assets under management. And we invest on behalf of primarily multinational corporations who have asked us to find emerging technologies that are of strategic interest to them and invest in them and then connect them um, for innovation and acceleration purposes. So I started out actually as an entrepreneur myself on the entrepreneur side, um, but have been a venture capitalist now for a little over 20 years. Um, and so I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bill. I'm going to move around to Mark, who's the next person in my Zoom window. Good. Uh, so I'm Mark Bagley. Yes, I'm Managing Director at uh, Woodside Capital Partners. Um, at uh, Woods, Woodside's a mid-sized uh, M&A advisory. So we're a tech-focused tech advisory. So we get uh, deep into the weeds of all the tech stuff here in uh, Silicon Valley. We're based in Palo Alto. Um, I focus on cloud and IT and telco, and the reason for the telco is prior to Woodside, I was running corporate development for British Telecom BT. So I um, hope to bring perspective on the M&A side and also on the, the telco wireless side as well. Thanks, Mark. Trisha? Sure. You stack up the M&A people in a row. Uh, so <laughs> my name is Trisha Salonero. I'm a managing director and head of the uh, technology 
focused sector of the investment bank within Stout. Uh, Stout is a you know nearly thousand person organization that uh, works with companies around financial advisory. So everything from you need a quality of earnings, you need an opening balance sheet, you need evaluation. Also within that, a hundred person investment bank that has sector coverage. And so what's been interesting about that for me was seeing the application of the technology and the transactions and formerly working with Mark, which was a joy, um, you know, moving forward into the applications of those other industries. So how does it relate to uh, you know, our industrial uh, you know, sector group? How does it relate to uh, a new person who just started who has all of this great agricultural and ag tech experience? And so, you know, over the course of the last 20 plus years, is that how we're counting, Bill? Um, the 20 plus years, <laughs> I've done 100 transactions across tech, and it's, uh, you know, great to be here and for the third, maybe fourth time uh, at What's Hot or What's Not. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Lisa. Thanks for being here. And last but certainly not least, Henry. Thank you for inviting me here. So my name is Henry Xu. I'm partner of CyberNot Investment. We headquarter here in Silicon Valley, and we focus on early stage technology company. Uh, so far, we have about 30 portfolio company. Uh, luckily, uh, three of them has been a uh, unicorn, which means the valuation is uh, over $1 billion. US dollar. Uh, I'm so excited today uh, attending this event because uh, another part of my, 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 my career, uh, the first job uh, after college, I was working for Motorola. And that time, I still remember my first phone uh, is Motorola, uh, very big one. At that time, the nickname is a brick uh, mm -hmm. at the phone. <laughs> it's very heavy. You have to you, probably you, you you will feel comfortable using two hands to hold phone. And today, uh, you know, I'm using uh, Apple phone, so I I can see. I have to say, a wireless technology have played so important role in all innovation and changing everybody's life. So again, thank you for inviting me. So excited to be here. Thanks for being here, Henry. I think your your sentiments are, are for everyone. I think the uh, the wireless industry, as we all know, has has really um, uh, been the front runner uh, in in how our lives have changed over the last twenty plus years. Um, and with that, I think I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, what is really happening, what's hot and what's not. I will say that when we all sat down, sort of in our pre panel chat to to talk about what is hot and what is not. Um, you know, industrial IoT is something I think we've been talking about for years now. And so it almost seems, there were some questions like, well, is this really hot or is this just sort of something that's ubiquitous? Um, but I think we all agreed it's it's ubiquitous and it's um, and it's it's necessary. And there are some really hot areas within uh, edge industrial IoT, um, AI and so forth. So today I'd like to dive a little bit into those areas and get your perspectives as, as the feet on the street, the people who are seeing what's going on in the world as to what is cool. Um, I think I'd like to start with talking just generally about uh, when you look at uh, what's happening in the world right now, high level, what is the hottest thing you guys are seeing? Um, I'll start with I'll start with uh, Henry since you were the last step this time, maybe the first step this time. What's the what's the hottest thing you're seeing? And and in general, I'd also like to make sure that we set the ground rules for everyone. Feel free to ask questions in the Q and A um, or post messages, and you know I'll try to get to those as and when I can. So with that, uh, Henry. Uh, thank you, thank you for question. So um, there's a lot of hard things. I think uh, we are lucky in Silicon Valley. We saw all kind of innovation. Uh, people talking about, for example, sustainability, ESG, uh, crypto, and uh, uh, agriculture tech, all kind of things. Uh, for us, we think advantage uh, for being in Silicon Valley. We are always looking for uh, technology driven innovation. Um, so there's a lot of hard things for me. Uh, so for me, I really looking into infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, uh, the reason. So again, uh, um, I'm not sure how many audience from our local in Bay area. So I always share some story, like for example, uh, I still remember we went to hiking, uh, to a neat, beautiful mountain in Bay area. And we have about a, 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 a certain a, a group of people, and we need a three cars. We so we happy drive there, and we realize when we arrive there, there's more more than one parking lot. 
<laughs> and then uh, there's no signal, uh, no wireless signal. You know, again, I, I'm in background is wireless. So it's very embarrassing. We were not able to find each other and end up with uh, uh, hiking in three separate groups. So, so, uh, so I think that the infrastructure side has a lot of room for 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 innovation, a, a, a lot of opportunities. Again, also in other areas. So, for us, we're looking for infrastructure. For example, uh, one area is a private, uh, private four G or private five G. Uh, the commercial operators they have a they have a hesitate because they, when they calculate the return on investment, they're looking for the uh, a population density area, but probably not all area for, for people has need. So uh, potentially if we can see the opportunity by using private, by, uh, by private 5G or 4G, and we, can, we could reach a good coverage and uh, make people life much better. So, Probably I share this one area. I'm happy to share other area at a later time. I'd love to hear what the rest of you guys think. Um, you know, areas like infrastructure obviously is a real interesting thing for all the people who are on this webinar. Um, you know, I I hear what you're saying, Henry, and I look towards some of the more innovative things I've seen: uh, Helium, Freedom Fi, um, Pollen Mobile. You know, there's a bunch of things like that. You know, what what are you guys seeing out there? You think is kind of interesting in the infrastructure world right now? Um, thank you for probably just a, a, a just a elaborate a little more. So I think one hot company uh, we have been seeing Helium, and uh, uh, for example Helium. So, so they are using decentralized for IoT coverage. Uh, this very a uh, very amazing company has a big uh, a good get a lot of good attention. Another company is called a uh, uh, Freedom Five. Uh, freedom fight. They try to using uh, just like I mentioned, a private four G or five G to give give people have a good coverage in their remote area. Um, and also, I I like to share one company we're looking into is a Poland. Uh, we have a close friends is investor for them. So, <laughs> uh, story make story short. So the 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 founder for Poland, in fact, they start with a self driving car. They they want to implement self driving service in a lot of areas, but they just they realize one challenge for them is there are no good wireless coverage because the self driving car need a wireless data coverage to navigate their their driving services. So they they separate uh, start separate uh, co a company is called Poland. Again, they have a challenge in regarding financial to establish a huge good coverage network. So they leveraging right now is a controversial uh, uh, design crypto web three or mm -hmm. blockchain to incentivize individual to build uh to to build a coverage in their areas. So um again uh, people are innovating financially technologically to uh, provide an infrastructure for people here. So I I believe there's a good opportunity uh using decentralized uh. Uh, financial incentive to mm -hmm. uh, to reach some uh, some courage, which we cannot do to before. You make a great point, Henry. I think it's it's interesting. It's certainly been a fascinating week or so for uh, for crypto, uh, blockchain, and and everyone everyone in between. Um, I think both Helium sounds like Pollen as well. Freedom Fi. Everyone seems to be using some sort of token, some sort of utility token, to incentivize um, users to help contribute to the network or, or hold the network, carry the network forward. Um, have, have any of you besides Henry seen anything kind of in that, in that realm? Um, it's kind of interesting using, using incentives like that to, to drive uh, industrial IOT technologies, um, infrastructure, anything like that? Um, of course, of course, um, of course. So um, there's a, um, um, uh, so again, uh, I mentioned we're looking for infrastructure. So in fact, infrastructure, of course, technology side, also for the crypto blockchain or Web3, there mm -hmm. are also infrastructure need. So uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a, a lot of startups, uh, probably we don't have the in, the enough time yeah. to talk about that. Uh, there's a lot of startups doing layer one, layer zero, uh, which provide infrastructure services. Mm -hmm. And again, the people are designing a financial innovation. I can see that it's financial innovation 
to design a uh, infrastructure to using token to uh, to to give financial reward for people contribute to the infrastructure uh, building process. So this is a, um, is an experiment process. Some failure, some successful. Uh, we are still looking into that, but I think there's a, a, a good opportunity. Probably we'll see some winter, but uh, I think I believe there's an opportunity uh, in near future. Bill and Trisha, Mark, do you, do any of was, you guys see these? Yeah, I was just going to come back to the coverage question. I think you know, I think the telcos realized they they built their own network, right? There was this. Uh, this, they built these this high this supposedly high speed high capacity network, but it only went like three feet or something because it used spectrum that didn't go anywhere. So um, I think we might see the whole five G restart, you know, to help out the coverage. It's not going to it's not going to um, fix all the problems, but with, they've got this. Um, I guess it's like this Goldilocks story going on in spectrum. There's the the old spectrum we used to have, which is you know goes everywhere, but it's really really slow. So that's kind of like you know too cold. And then you got the the spectrum they tried to use was just this uh, millimeter wave, which doesn't go anywhere. It's like your microwave. It kind of gets absorbed, you know, within about three feet. Slight exaggeration, but it does get absorbed very quickly. And so that one's too hot. And so the, the one that's just right is this mid, what's this mid-band spectrum that the, there's just a lot of auctions in and the folks are just starting to deploy. In fact, uh, T-Mobile got a bit of a march on that because they they had some spectrum with, from Sprint as well. And so the other guys are catching up. I think that one's going to be the one that helps with the ubiquitous nature that was advertised about 5G. But it, it's not going to help entirely. I mean, satellite's going to fill in. Um, that's going to be a, a, a big one, right? So, I mean, Bill, you had some um, some uh, some thoughts on that, I think. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, and and we'll get to satellite. I just I just wanted to expand upon the whole infrastructure mm. um, question. And it depends, um, you know, it's interesting. We in Silicon Valley use the word infrastructure to mean a variety of different things. Most, most of the world thinks of infrastructure as, you know, um, roads and airports and ports and bridges, right? Um, you know, we talk about infrastructure in terms of, you know, technology layers, yeah. um, which, is, which, is, which is fine and, and good as well. But to take it to the sort of, you know, old world concept of, of infrastructure, it's interesting to see the evolution of, you know, smart over the last roughly, I don't know, roughly a decade. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, and, and, and as much as, as two decades of, you know, clean tech being attached to smart, to smart buildings. Um, and, you know, sort of as IoT has evolved, what we have seen is sort of increasing number of applications of sensors and smart associated with our infrastructure, right? Our smart, you know, smart cities and uh, smart buildings and trying to make everything smart that we can make smart, smart parking lots, right? <laughs> this is back to Henry's comment about his hiking buddies. Um, so we have seen, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question if we were, you know, ten years ago, and it was, it was, it was even more than that. It was um, more, more years ago than that when sort of IoT was sort of the next big thing. Has it gone? I mean, it has now become pervasive. We see, we see IoT, you know, sensors everywhere, um, especially when you consider that a camera is a sensor, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we see sensors everywhere. Um, and, and, you know, I'm torn on whether it has gone as fast as we thought or hoped, or whether it's been slower than we thought or hoped. Um, I do think, yeah, we were expecting, for example, parking, um, to, you know, to become intelligent and it's gotten sort of a little bit better, right? I don't know. I mean, um, not that much better. How much smarter have our cities gotten? I don't notice that traffic management is that <laughs> much smarter. Um, you know, you would think it would be smarter than it is. But, um, you know, we all still have the problem that the goddamn lights aren't changing when they should, if they were just a little bit smarter. And, you know, we've it's recently, you know, I have seen a couple of pitches, you know, trying to say, you know, now we now we can have smart traffic. Um, so it's, it's, it's on the one hand been, you know, wildly successful getting more sensors out there, collecting more data and, but it's only incrementally improved 
um, I think. So, you know, I don't know. You tell me, am I wrong? Am I, I think you're, I mean, to my way of thinking, you're absolutely right. And I, and I look at that issue and I look at sort of what's hot, right? And there's a lot of things that I think could be very, very hot. Mm -hmm. But the practical implementation of those technologies, to your point, is mm -hmm. what complicates things. So, for example, you're selling into big government. You're trying to make cities smarter. Cities have very you know, big budgets in some senses, but also very small budgets, right? They have to cover a lot of ground with those budgets. And so you could have the hottest, coolest technology. Um, and and if, if you can't convince the people who are going to implement that technology that it's really worth it for them, they yeah. won't do it. And if it's if it's solving the world's problems, but maybe not their problem, I mean, I've seen this a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you. I mean, the it's a fair question. Where is the economic value capture in making traffic smarter? We did. Um, you know, another example is is making streetlights smarter. I mean, I think you know, we've gotten. I don't know how much better we've gotten at that, right? <laughs> But, um, you know, and which where which would have a direct energy savings impact. Right. So, oh, for sure. right. You can. Um, and I think we have relatively stupid rotating, you know, outages on our street, you know, lights to save money, I guess. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, where is well, I think you need to have some specificity to the problem that you're solving. When people say IOT, I, I think you're right, Bill. I mean, it, it's as meaningless to me in some respects as saying, oh yeah, and it's an AI company. It's like, unless you tell me like what problem they're solving, <laughs> you know, with the sensors, you know, with maybe an edge compute, with, you know, machine learning on top of that, you know, directed at a specific thing, like uh, making sure that a field is, you know, being watered, uh, making sure, you know, back to, to Mark's comment about the spectrum. I mean, there's a company called Aura that got $75 million this year from Fortress, right? They're building a network so that we can figure out what drones are doing, right? <laughs> uh, and, and where are they in that, um, you know, in that spectrum? Uh, so you can have FAA control over it. Right. Or maybe you're trying to, you know, abstract the technology and provide something like telecom as a service, you know, a company that says, OK, I'm now I'm going to take this and, and create an API layer and I'm now going to go deliver, you know, telecom to Brazil. Right. I mean, that you're trying to tackle something with some of these technologies that, that we're talking about. You know, I think that's that's where the dollars hit the road this year in a year that is down you know, at least 30%, if not 90% in some markets kind of across the tech spectrum. I think the dollars that that I saw going into specific, you know, later stage technologies, I mean, even some of the earlier ones, were solving a very specific problem um, and and not as much on the infrastructure side. I mean, to, to all of our dismay um, in moving around the valley. Uh, but I think that's coming, right? With the amount of government dollars that went in and, you know, is legislated to go in over the next couple of years, I do think we'll see more of that. Do you think it it's the, um, are, we, are we back onto the, uh, the you know, the, the, is it a light bulb problem? You know, we, in just bringing the back to consumers, we had these fantastic new light bulbs came in that were far more efficient, lasted much longer, but people didn't go out and change all the light bulbs straight away. It was a gradual thing, right? As soon as one light bulb failed, you went out and, and bought it and then there was the government aspect was that you at on one stage you couldn't buy the old incandescent uh, light bulbs you had to buy the new ones and so i guess it's a mix of both right because I'm, I'm just thinking you know for a green field situation where you're building you know you build a new road and you want to put some lights in surely you put smart lights in in that situation but for a retro where you've got lights already it's the incremental piece of why would you swap out perfectly good lights for smart lights that give you only a small fraction better i guess that's it comes back to the same motivations in the consumer market. So maybe that's it. It's very interesting. You're, you're, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. No, uh, so I just want to share uh, some of uh, our experience. So we have one portfolio company exactly to mention, uh, uh, did what uh, Mark, Bill, Tracy, what you, you, you talk about. So basically that's uh, a smart building company. They have AI, they have all things. And they're using sensors uh, for control, uh, you know, control the temperature of the rooms. And they have all data regarding the failure, for example, light bulb. So they know this light bulb only work for, uh, you know, uh, this hours or this two years. 
and they will remind the technician to change that before it fail or something mm -hmm. like that. So, uh, but go, uh, but this uh, this company running um, uh, doing good, but uh, not very amazing because I think Lisa comments earlier. So the the challenging for this company because the sensor they have a technician to install the sensors, and they, they, so uh, so for the for example they reach some uh, university campus is easier need a cycle time of about two years. But they try to reach city, and the cycle time is kind of five years or six years. They have a lot of discussion how to implement that. So I, I think. Uh, thank you for sharing all comments. I just want to sound, uh, share one specific example I experienced. It makes complete sense. I think what I'm hearing in in this sort of trends of what what's hot and kind of the theme that I'm I'm pulling from this is, in past days, in past years, I should say, we've often look at looked at what's hot as being like what's innovative, what's cool, like what do we think is kind of like we're gravitating towards because we think it's just amazing innovation. And in these tighter times where we are facing economic uncertainty uh, now and in the year ahead and the years ahead, um, I see several trends that I'm, I'm, I'd like to get your thoughts on. One is, and I've heard this in what you've just said, is government funding or government mandates of sorts tend to drive things. So for example, if the government says, well, you can't have these light bulbs anymore, you've got to have these light bulbs, you know, people are like, okay, well, I guess I got to you know, pony up and get those light bulbs. Um, a conversation we had earlier uh, about sustainability. Some corporations have sustainability charters and they have to hit certain uh, numbers for sustainability. So maybe that's kind of hot because if you fit in that area. Um, the other thing is the pandemic, of course. You know, we'd like to all pretend that it's completely over. It's totally not. And um, we're still having um, lots of health issues uh, for people at home. So even though people can still go back to their offices, um, you know, we've seen a lot of illness, we've seen children get very ill, and so people are having to stay home more, either to care for loved ones or because they themselves are sick. So there's a lot of trends that are sort of forced upon us by the circumstances that we are in today versus what we thought like five or six years ago, which was like, wow, this is so much faster, we should use this particular infrastructure because it's better and it's faster. Is that, am I seeing this, um, is this, yeah, is this a real trend or am I like making this up? No, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> I think you are, uh, you know, it's, there are a lot of factors that are involved in the adoption of a new technology, right? And, yeah. and, you know, one of the factors, obviously, the one we tend to think of mainly as investors is the economic factor, you know, is this half as half the cost or last twice as long or, you know, save whatever, right? So that's, that's obviously one factor, but the thing that you're, you know we're 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 touching on here is is where does it rank in priority in terms of decision making, even sort of you know sort of separate from the economics of it, and that gets to the the issue that we always we always push entrepreneurs on and we push ourselves on is is the reality is it doesn't matter how cool the technology is. It's got to be some, it's got to solve, you know, this is Trisha's point. It's got to solve somebody's hair on fire problem, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it can't just be, you know, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could replace all the light bulbs and think of the money we would save, yeah. you know, that's not the way that's, you know, that's the point of this discussion. It's not the way the world actually operates, right? And, and there are all of these second order effect issues of, of, you know, if you're going to make a smart building or you're going to implement something smart, then you've got an infrastructure requirement that some smart person who is probably going to be expensive has got to both install and manage, um, which is a whole new overlay, which requires a different budget cycle, which blah, 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 right? So, um, you know, the adoption and implementation of technology is 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 very complicated and it's why it's why being a VC is so tough, which is, you know, I mean, you know, what you can demonstrate in a pilot doesn't solve the, you know, doesn't address all of the issues that you need to address when you are talking about trying to scale up, right? Because there's just so many other factors that are involved in, in, in scaling up. And so that, I, that, I think that's what we're experiencing. That's kind of our frustration right now with the um, relatively, uh, well, I guess sort of disappointingly slow pace of, 
of technology change that it's you know all that other stuff that's getting in the way like economics and people right silly right. yeah that's silly stuff right <laughs> i mean i i think we've also got that you know the the pig in the python problem of the pandemic created supply chain issues workforce issues you know I, installation issues um for all of these vendors which had this incredible ripple effect Right. And so I, you know, I think we're going to be feeling this for a while uh, in terms of all of those things kind of lining back up so that, you know, these really cool technologies that make a lot of sense to do, even though they're not maybe somebody's hair on fire problem, but it's a, a prudent person's problem. Um, those will come. Right. I think it's just it's going to take us a little bit to level set. Um, you know, all of the money that went into tech, uh, the repricing of all of that that's happened over the last year. Um, but on the bright side, for me, I, I look at it and say, now all these other sectors have, you know, it's affordable to go and buy a technology company to implement tech in this space, that the, you know, pricing will drop so that you can get both a technician and the, the technology piece into the same, you know, infrastructure place at the same time. It's so interesting that you should say that, Trisha, because I look at this um, sort of the world forces that are happening at the moment, and I think you're absolutely right. You look at the valuations and you look at what people are willing to pay and you look at inflation and you look at cost, and it does seem like now's a really great time to buy um, if you can find the right thing. Um, if you if you can can find that nugget that's going to light someone's hair, you know, that's there to, to fix a problem that someone's hair is on fire and they're going to... Um, this solution is going to fix it. Yeah, if you've got if you've got some money kicking around, uh, you know, in private equity or in you know in some large corporates, they've got you know they've got cash hanging around in their back pockets. And then this is obviously a good time to uh, to spend some of that cash. If you had your list already that you were going to thinking of acquiring, in, you know, this is a hot sector. I'd love to get involved in this, but it was uh, too expensive. You know, the the SaaS multiples were what were they a year ago, like sixteen to twenty x, and now they're like five to seven x or something. So. If you're after a SaaS company, yeah, certainly now is a good time to to buy if you're going to acquire someone. But uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that uh, that's going to drive some some change, I think. Well, and I do think also just um, if we think about the macro influences at, at, at play here, um, and not to keep harping on about the pandemic because no one really wants to talk about it, but um, I do think that that is going to continue to have an interesting impact on workforce and opportunities in industrial IoT. So if we think about um, the number of people who are going to become long-term disabled or ill because of uh, long COVID, and they're saying now that it could be, even in the vaccinated population, upwards of 25, 20, 25% of people who get COVID and then they get really devastatingly ill. Um, and many of the people you know, that I know have, have ended up in that, maybe not the devastating camp, but in the, yikes, didn't realize they were going to have these issues to worry about for the rest of their, you know, life at age 20, 30, 40. Um, and each time people get ill, it's kind of cumulative, right? Like you can get, there's going to be maybe 25% today, but it might be 30, 40% by the end of this pandemic. So question for, for you guys, do you see some of these technologies, especially software as a service and industrial IOT opportunities where you can get in with these companies to relieve some of the workload that actual people are doing, um, whether it be industrial IoT in a warehouse, for example, um, robots, um, drones, what have you, um, or you're looking at software as a service, it can kind of take some of the burden off of the mind, you know, the minds of people and, and put it sort of towards machines. Are you seeing any sort of interesting things happening there that's, that's relevant for this particular conversation? Yeah, I'll I'll jump in on that one because um, uh, it's um, it's related to to one of the companies we've invested in. Just to you know tout our portfolio, right, Henry? <laughs> so, um, is to is a is a um, a company a a intelligent robot company called Mujin um, out of Japan that has been spectacularly successful, um, whereas. You know, amazingly, most of the smart robot companies really haven't done that well. And yeah. you know, there was there was a huge sort of assumption 
that, you know, that now that we have AI and now that we have sensors and now that you can collect all this data and get so smart that finally, finally robots could do what people do. Um, and it turned out, it turned out that um, it was just so much harder than anyone thought that in so many ways, in so many ways, AI has fallen short um, in terms of its ability to do kind of what we thought or hoped it could do. Um, and, and, and so it's been interesting seeing this company, Mujin, which is, you know, has, has decided, they've decided that machine learning is a dead end, that machine learning can never get you a perfect representation of the world because that's just the nature of machine learning that, you know, you can asymptotically approach, you know, 98, 99, maybe 99.5% of the world. But if you're talking about running a factory and, you know, that line has got to be going at high speed all the time, 24 seven, or at least, you know, in between, you know, if, if something falls apart on that line and stops the line, that can be just hugely expensive. And, and so you've just, you know, you've got a lot of, in, of companies, a lot of manufacturing companies that are saying, yep, you know, really love that kind of AI robotic stuff, but um, hey, we'll do a little pilot over here or we'll, you know, maybe we can have it pick and pack some stuff, not that important, but um but anything core, anything central, forget about it. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna trust our line to ninety eight point five percent. You know, that's just not good enough um, for um, for a lot of companies that are interested in in trying to automate. But um, so, what, what do you, how do you spell Mujin, by the way? M U J I N. And what are they doing? Um, you said they don't, they sort of feel like ML is a, a dead end. How are they, how are they circumventing? So how are they circumventing that? What's their, so it's um, not about them. You know, it's a, a team of PhDs out of Carnegie Mellon who all have been trained in AI, who basically said, you know, there's a better way if, you know, in, in most, in most situations, you can create a robust, intelligent, intelligence about solving a particular problem by creating a model of the world that is the physics of the world um, that defines a category of problem you need to solve. And then it turns out that you can use, you can use AI and, you know, machine vision, and there's some other, th other ways you can use AI. But in terms of the underlying model of the world, you need a model of the world that is more or less perfect in terms of the physics of the of the of the world you're operating in and so they call their model of intelligent they call their framework for intelligence model based rather than machine learning based um and that has given them and so you know okay now i'm pitching that it's they had that that's given them um you know seven nines seven <laughs> nines of, of, of precision so interesting. So I'm um, just to clarify then, they're basically, a, are they a model, ca model creator, a model catalog, or are they helping people who want to make the models, make the models more efficiently? So they, they deliver a complete solution. They deliver okay. and, you know, they, they take their, you know, they take their model, they implement it on a FANAC robot or a Iskawa robot, whatever. Um, they have built their own end effectors and they have, you know, designed their own sensors um, because, you know, they've got to be very, very smart about their world in terms of both, you know, vision as well as weight and some other factors that they need to know about. Um, but they're using industry standard robots, um, and they're basically replacing the operating system with their own operating system. Got it. Got it. And I think we're seeing that in, in other technology situations as well, where this concept of sort of synthetic AI you know, where I'm going to create the perfect scenario under which we need to operate <laughs> um, and control everything from the, the silicon on up, right? Um, in order to purpose build, you know, a, a, um, a robot, if you will, that's going to tackle one thing, right? So I think we're seeing that, you know, in software, 
um, you know, aimed at MarTech spend. We're seeing it at uh, remote patient monitoring. We're mm -hmm. seeing it at, uh, you know, AI addressing things like, um, you know, calling into your bank, right? Um, so I think it, it definitely goes back to, you know, how do you perfect for the situation that you're trying to solve, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, and the AI, is, it's always been, um, it's, I don't think this has changed, right? The AI, is to, to what Tricia was saying, so Bill, is that um, the more specific you can get on the AI and what it has to do, the better it is, right? You know, you just think of, coming back to a consumer example again, you know, think of, you know, I'm going to kick off a whole lot of assistance here, but, you know, the Google Assistant and the Siri, and I mentioned, mentioned Alexa as well, so everyone's phones are going off now. Um, but if you if you ask them just a general question, you know, the, the chances are you're not going to get a, a suitable answer. But if you put that situation in a car, you know, CarPlay or um, uh, well, I forget what the Google version is called, but you know, the Google version of that, you know, they know all about the car and they know how to everything. Any, any question you can ask in the car, they'll be able to do it. But uh, you, you give them a, a question that's outside of the context, you know, not, not so good. So I think that's the general principle with AI, right? The more specific you can get, the better it is. But um, mm -hmm. I think we'll get there though. Every year we're getting better and better with this stuff. I mean, I don't know when that is that we'll have this perfect AI. Maybe never. It's it, going to be uh, interesting because it, all to to Bill's point, and I think to Trisha's as well. It's like you know, to try to get this to be done better. It sounds like you kind of have to start doing very custom work, not just on the AI front, but on the hardware front as well. And so that becomes a more complex issue because if you're trying to scale that, so that you're not just talking about, for example, cars, um, but you want the same robot to do the same thing at the factory, one thing at the factory, and another thing at like I don't know, the the local gym, for example, you're not going to be able to have that. You're going to have to get very specific with with the ways that these different things solve different problems. And so, yeah, a different um, a different model, at least, right? You just apply a different model to it. Yeah, but it's a whole new model they have to learn. Yeah, yeah, right. and and applying that kind of digital twin technology, right? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I see another uh, uh, probably some opportunity also. For example, we're talking about smart home, talking about AI, and today we're talking about AI on edge. So, um, so we see one one is a pretty a pretty good example regarding that. So I'm not sure how many of you using, for example, Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant these things. Uh, this kind of um, processing mostly on uh, server side, cloud side. So you see, turn on the light, turn off light, or uh, play music, and this kind of information uh, uh, processing on the cloud. And uh, some people feel very comfortable, some people feel some privacy challenges because uh, probably later time, the cloud have more knowledge regarding your behavior and uh, daily routine, what, what kind of things. Uh, we see uh, we have we have a portfolio company. They're doing on edge. So for is the reason the computational power on small chip size more powerful and the cons uh, energy consumption has decreased. So they could do locally. For example, uh, the smart home. When you want to turn off the light, you don't have to pass your command to the cloud processing and post back. Okay. So the device will process your command locally and turn on the light directly and turn off to, to other things. The smart home, in that case, you don't rely on the communication on the cloud and don't you, you don't release your privacy information also. So that's the thing I think probably match our topic today, AI and Edge. And this is something we see a good opportunity also. Interesting. Um, thinking about th things that um, are kind of cool right now, generative AI seems to be you know a really interesting really hot area. Are you guys seeing much happening in that, that you, that you think is in terms of hot, um, you know, yeah. not just hot, cool, but like hot, actually like, wow, this could actually, you know, get some good multiples here. I think, well, it's right. I, I mean, I think we're going to go through, we're going to go through the um, Gartner hype curve, right? I mean, I, it's pretty predictable. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but you know, we've been, it's, and it's been, it does sort of fit the other, the other model of, um, uh, you know, innovation is invisible, 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 and that boom, it pops up, right? You know, we have seen generative AI for, you know, several years, but there is this sort of breakthrough that happened with a couple of companies that suddenly, you know, put some things out that are, that are generating some pretty interesting results. All of a sudden, you know, I think I, Mark was saying before, you know, all of a sudden the quality has gotten to the level that, oh, that's, you know, that's noticeably better than it was only a few years ago. 
And so now everybody, everybody's got to at least play with it, right? You can't afford not to look at generative AI, you know, if you're, you know, depending sort of pretty, pretty horizontal. I mean, we're still kind of, I think, well, it was it's sort of, I don't know, mainly text. And now we got image. Um, yeah. so text and image affects pretty much everybody. Um, you know, we'll get to video and audio and video. I mean, people are already doing some stuff with audio and video and, um, you know, and then code, right? And then code, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> we'll see. I mean, so again, we've seen, we've seen some interesting examples over the years in all of these spaces. Um, but I think because of the, the you know these companies that um, you know OpenAI released the their their um, and I'm yeah. blank what they call it forgive me yeah. um, but they're um, and so now everybody can play with it so everybody has to play with it because you can't afford not to know what's going on yeah and then they, we'll probably get the usual cycle and I think it's started to happen where you know the open source will, will grab hold of that as well and create open source versions so we you know we get the the folks that don't want to buy into someone's tech and build on top of that they build on top of the open source and we get this competing thing going on for a while which drives innovation and then uh, we'll end up with something uh, much better in a few years time and maybe you know for a few companies will um come out of that I guess it's going to be based on open source and that'll be my bet you know in a few years time yeah, I mean it's uh, and I I think I might have said this a couple a few years ago at at this event. I'm not sure, but so I got into trouble. I got into trouble back in 2014. I was on a panel and I said, um, and I said, AI is not an investable proposition. Um, yeah. and, kind of like you said, AI is dead today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it'll never work. <laughs> and. You know, and my point at the time was, and my point today is not that AI doesn't deliver value, but that you can't fund AI for the sake of AI. And this is Trisha's point, which is that AI clearly was going to be commoditized. Right. And, you know, it was clearly, you know, on a pathway that every high school student was going to have an AI project in just a few years, right? And voila, right? That's where we are. So, you know, AI is AI is commoditized. And so, you know, if you're in, going to invest in AI, you can't assume that the AI is the intellectual property. So, you know, what does that mean for generative AI as a business model opportunity? That's a really interesting question because, you know, I think where, you know, Mark, you're going is it's going to be, it's going to be commoditized. Yeah. And so, how do you build a business? But what it, yeah, I mean, what it means for this conversation that we're having, though, is if you're going to have that level of compute, it's going to happen at the edge, right? Um, because it we just happen. don't have the infrastructure yet. <laughs> well, it right? depends on what you're generating, right? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I, where's the real time requirement for generating? Right. Right? Um, nah, you know, there will be. You know, you want an avatar, you want, you know, I want, I want to have a conversation with Einstein, um, you know, and, and yeah, that's, that's an interesting, you know, uh, how, I don't know if we'll have that at the edge, when we'll have that at the edge, but we'll see. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's very compute intensive, but as Henry points out, we're getting, you know, more better chips that are getting smarter you know, at the edge, still not, you know, quite there yeah. yet. But, We'd yeah. never, um, we didn't quite get to the stuff that was supposed to be at the edge though, right? The, the edge was supposed to be the VR stuff and, you know, acting like, you know, a doctor's going to be 6,000 miles away and going to be perform on an operation and all that kind of stuff. I real think time. Yeah. it is going to be more this AI stuff, right? The real time, you know, you don't want to send the data up in real time to the cloud. You want to send it to a more local cloud, but you don't want that on premise because it costs a lot. You have to run it, et cetera, look mm -hmm. after it. And so, You'd rather someone else did that, the cloud model, but just kind of have the cloud model a bit closer, please. And I think that's that's definitely gonna that's gonna definitely gonna be uh, successful. And um, you know, we've seen all the um, all the folks that you know, there's a bit of a gold rush now. All the folks deploying to have you know the usual suspects, of course, in cloud, just trying to be at local cloud as well. But you've also got the colo folks and the the mobile tile folks, and you've got even Akamai on the CDN network there. They bought Linode and, um, you know, made a, a big investment there. And I think they want to get into that space as well. So a bit of a gold rush, though. There's definitely something there. So, Well, and Amazon's got, you know, their Lambda at Edge, right? I mean, they're everybody's trying to say, okay, well, have, we got to take this offline. 
how are we going to do it? And that's going to enable things like smarter, you know, remote patient monitoring, right? Which might have some subcute yeah. intensity mm -hmm. depending on, you know, how we're going to manage to Lisa's point, how we're going to manage with, you know, more sick people with fewer people who can, you know, triage sick people. Right. right. And you know, yeah, you know who the sick people are. A lot of the sick people are the people who are treating the sick people. Right. So the doctors and the, the hospitals, I mean, this is going to be very interesting, right? These, these folks that we've been relying on to help us as a community, as a, as a world are going to really need our help. Um, especially if they weren't adequately protected, um, after their first few infections themselves. And that works well in cities, but now what about, you know, out, you know, in rural areas, um, you know, which gets to, you know, what do you do with the data? How do you transport it? You could go back to microsatellites. <laughs> <laughs> that was a conversation we started at one point, right? What's hot? Yeah. Well, microsatellites are definitely hot. You see what Elon is in. It's basically in all the hot things, you it's know? all the hot things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like Twitter. dumpster fires are hot. <laughs> they are, they are hot. definitely hot. <laughs> 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 it's okay bill <laughs> well, yeah, one, I one of bill's wanna, people i know i do want to do, do well right and so we we and i still want to talk about satellites but yes. i also i just i also want to touch on um on the healthcare thing and lisa you know yeah covid it, i mean obviously it's 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 a pretty big thing but it's not that big a thing compared to things like you know, diabetes and hypertension and congestive heart failure and dementia and Alzheimer's. I mean, right. but it's um, the trigger for all of those things, right? The protein, the protein uh, issue is uh, triggering uh, diabetes uh, and heart attack and all these things that we're talking about. So they're going to all be big. And the pandemics to come. Right. And the, but, but yeah, 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 yeah. So no, but I do think, you know, to the original thesis, what's hot, what's not, all right, that, that the pandemic more, you know, more sort of, indirectly than directly well i'm not sure how to how to how to draw that line but it's not because of covid but because of everything that happened because of covid you know the, the healthcare technology um environment has changed pretty dramatically pretty quickly um now again it's not yet pervasive but to the back to the government regulation side of things again because of covid all of a sudden, you know, Medicare and the, the rest of the gang realized, oops, you know, we can't be stuck in the old, um, the old protocols of, of what, what is required for a doctor to make a diagnosis and to prescribe a drug. We've got to have other ways for doctors to diagnose and, and prescribe drugs. And that gets to, you know, what, what we, we touched on, the whole telemedicine side of thing and the remote patient monitoring side of things. And, you know, the, the movement and, you know, to do, to do remote patient monitoring is, is, you know, key. Wireless is key. So wireless is key. Um, you know, we've got an issue with, um, with, with radios, radio, you know, the cost of radios and the efficiency of radios and therefore battery life. If you're going to do wearables, you know, you don't want everybody to be plugged in, right. <laughs> in order to monitor them, um, like, you know, the old image of the ICU, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to have people who are going to be, they're going to be connected, um, but not wired. And, and we're going to be able to see, you know, scores of vitals, not just one, you know, not just, you know, your pulse rate, not just your glucose level, but all sorts of vitals that we're going to be able to see simultaneously assess. And that's going to lead to all sorts of predictive algorithms around, you know, anticipating dementia, anticipating diabetes, anticipating hypertension, you know, and anticipating all these diseases that hopefully, hopefully, hopefully will, will make the healthcare system at least more efficient. Um, ultimately, it will wind up um, certainly being more expensive um, because, you know, at the well, end you know. of the day, you know, at the end of the day, you got to have a doctor decide on a treatment and buy the treatment and implement the treatment. Um, and that's all atoms, you know, it's atoms and moving people around. Um, but there's a lot of bits that can, you know, get us to better interventions faster. And again, that's, I, so I do think, 
Um, I, you know, I think that's definitely hot. I definitely think that's, you know, that's here to stay. It won't happen as fast as we'd like it to happen, but it's happening pretty fast. Th you know, thanks in part to the fact that government regulations are, you know, adjusting to this new reality, which again, is back to your point, Lisa, because of COVID, um, you know, all of the stakeholders in the system realized we don't have enough nurses. You know, we can't have push everybody into the hospital for everything. Our emergency rooms are overcrowded. The cost of treatment in a hospital is obscene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those things are pushing these innovations that, you know, are taking advantage of, you know, AI, wireless, IoT um, types of technologies that thank goodness, you know, this group is developing, right? <laughs> I think one of the things that you you raised, Bill, and I think it's so interesting is, and we had this conversation when we were kind of tag teaming around what to talk about today, is health tech itself is just a huge opportunity, right? Like that is hot. If you can figure out ways, I mean, that is one of the areas that's so rife with, uh, you know, problems and opportunities um, that I think I think um, we all agreed in talking about this, that, that is hot. You know, there's a bunch of different areas within there that are hot. Um, but to your point, Bill, like whatever ends up making it so that you can deliver a more effective um, treatment plan to to customers, patients, um, without having to see them in person or without having to, you know, spend a lot of face time. I think those those things are really interesting. Also interesting to me, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this. Is with the pandemic has come also this this illness has brought, brought to light the need for clean air and all the technologies uh, that go into that. And there's some fascinating wireless technologies around that. Um, you know, millimeter wave, uh, not millimeter wave, what am I saying? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about uh, far UV, germicidal UV, um, some of these really interesting technologies. Has, has anyone, see, do you guys think that's hot or is it just a quirky and interesting at this point? I think, I, I, you know, it because we were in, you know, we were monitoring that space um, for, you know, a bunch of our our corporate um, uh, partners who were obviously interested in um, in in their buildings and the health of their buildings. Um, and, I you know, I think COVID pushed some of that up the hype curve maybe faster than it should have. Um, so there was there was just a just a, a flood of companies starting up around around trying to figure out how to kill germs right um, using a variety of technologies including you know far UV um, and uh, and so I do think that that there's going to be a little bit um, I think there's going to there has to be a a resorting in that industry because I just the in the in this we're not going to call it post covid right we're not going to call it, we're going to call it um what do we call it the continuing covid the new normal the, yeah. the, the late covid the whatever <laughs> um but um phase long term squaly phase <laughs> right um, <laughs> that it's you know it's important but i i don't know i'm i'm it was a it was a hair on fire problem i think a year ago um and i just i think the that that hair on fire aspect of it has diminished. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of an itchy scalp problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's interesting though, where the money tracked on all of that. So there are a bunch of private equity firms today that are aggregating HVAC services companies. Uh, mm. And, um, you know, for more coverage, for more geographies, for more technologies and that, they're wrapping now software over the top of that. So I know where my people are, uh, you know, how, how did they get deployed to each building? And what I think we're going to see is as those building technologies, the sort of prop tech, you know, building technologies that, that flow out of the sensors, out of having cleaner air in the offices and all of that, that those implementations, those you know, installations 
um, will come now that money's gone into the services world, right? Uh, and and aggregated that. So I do think that you know your um, Gen Z coming to the workforce crew is going to say, "I want to be in a building that's not going to you know make me sick," mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to demand that it has at least a level of cleanliness that yeah. is done in a sustainable way. Um, and that you're not, you know, overusing uh, the um, the air conditioning or heating. And so there's going to be sensors around that. Um, and all of that will be automated and you'll wrap machine learning around it, right? So it, there will be this, you know, flow through of the dollars in the, in the industrial IoT piece of it and the sensor piece of it and aggregating all of that that will come out of you know, the dollars going into first HVAC uh, and then ultimately into and, and delivered through these sort of ESG initiatives around, you know, better, um, you know, better sustainability in buildings. One of the things that I hear you touching on without actually saying this, Tricia, but it's interesting, and I'm curious if this is what you meant or if I'm just reading too much into it, is the not only the clean buildings and clean air piece of things, but also the biosecurity piece of things is kind of interesting. Um, are you hearing much in the way of, of fires being lit about biosecurity at all? Is it hot or is it kind of just up and coming on the periphery? Well, I mean, I, mean, I you know, thank God there are people who are worried about it, um, but I don't think most people are worried about it. And so I think it's, you know, it, that's that's one of the examples of um, of things that that get driven by events, by current events, you know, in terms of, um, you know, and somebody, I don't know what the next, you know, anthrax or sarin or whatever event is going to be. Um, but, um, there will be another, you know, anthrax or sarin or whatever event. And then there'll be a bunch of entrepreneurs that say, I can solve that problem. And, you know, that could be, it'll be added as an API to the sensor. Uh, right. I mean, there, it will, it'll be part of the sensors that, that end up getting reinstalled in 10 years. Yeah. 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 But to the, you know, to the smart building point that, you know, that I think, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm I, I'm I'm surprised to hear myself say this about the value and importance of government regulation. You know, I mean, interesting. I mean, but you look at the data, and California, for all of our flaws here, you know, our building code has been so much more effective at reducing. Um, you know, building energy waste yes. uh, compared to, you know, the rest of the country. And, you know, it's not happening. It's not happening if the building code doesn't enforce it, right? Right. I, mean, it's just well, I, don't, I don't see many other states having the equivalent of a uh, like California Air Resources Board, CARB. You know, you don't see other states that say you can't, you know, send me that uh, filter, air filter or whatever, because it produces too much ozone. California says that you have to, you know, if you're going to make a new toy that, you know, cleans the air, you got to, you know, make sure it passes through carb compliance first. Um, and all those HVAC systems have to go through carb compliance too, in order to make it into buildings in California, which is very interesting. Yeah. So, um, you I'm know, interested in that we just, did I, I did, am I getting right? California just became the fifth largest economy in the world, right? I thought it was already the fifth largest, no? Okay, maybe it's the fourth. I don't know. We just passed Germany. We just passed Germany. So what does that make us? So we got U.S., China, Japan. Yeah, California. Right. I think we're now fourth. I think That's we're awesome. Fourth. Does that sound? Somebody will have the right answer out there in, in participant land. But, um, but um, Germany is the strongest in Europe for sure. So that that's, if, it's, yeah, if it's more than Germany, that rules out the whole of the rest of Europe. Yeah. So... Uh, so it makes, you know, so California has the right to be a, an independent country. And that's in the sense where I was going with that point was that because it's such a huge economy, you know, the ability of California to make a dent in these issues is very significant. And if only we were a little bit better at, you know, at sensible regulation, I don't know. Delivering the message. Yeah. It's. 
you know, so I don't want to throw the bathwater out with the baby or whatever, but you know, it is, there's, 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 there is something to be said for intelligent um, codes that um, create a win-win scenario, right? I do, I do um, personally wish that they had the same sort of federal mindset for the building codes with, with regard to clean air. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna see how that plays out over time, but it's gonna be a while. Yeah. Um, no, noting you were talking about the, uh, the participants and the, uh, the folks who, who may know what's going on uh, to, to one of the questions you had. Um, I see some Q and A here, and I, I wonder if we could go through that because I know that we're we're kind of rounding up the towards the end of our initial uh, conversation here. Um, we had a conversation that that was just asking a question about the, the startup that Bill was talking about, Mujin, and the question was what it what was but when they realized that that ML was a dead end, what was the application or use case that Mujin was working on? Would they yeah. re would they realize that? Yeah, I mean, was that what? Um, they started out, they now have, I can I should know off the top of my head, but you know, 12, 13, 14 different application domains within factory automation and logistics. And I think, you know, one of their early, one of the early applications was um, uh, palletizing and depalletizing, if you know what that is. So it's, um, so a truck comes in with a bunch of stuff in the back of the truck on a bunch of pallets, and you don't know what's on that pallet right? Um, and so how do you train an AI to figure out what's on that pallet and what to do with it? Not easy, right? There's a lot of data there. So um, instead, instead of you trying to use machine learning, what they did is, as, as, as Trisha figured out, is they used digital twin um, modeling to say, okay, let's let's look at the palette. Let's look what's on the palette. Let's see to what extent can we make a good guess as to what's on the palette. But we can define the edges of everything that's on the palette, and then we can go see how much they each weigh. Um, now, if we know what the SKUs are, then we know how much they should weigh. Um, if we don't know what the SKU number is, then we have to figure out how much they weigh, right? And so all of that is is can be has been now cooked into a model that's applicable in a tremendous number of applications in in warehousing logistics factory automation um can i just look at what's there and then what do i know what do i not know in order to figure out what to do with what's mm -hmm. there and and so they they have built this library of models that can be applied to you know all sorts of different situations now, um, you know bin AGVs, palletizing, depalletizing, pick and place. You know what if it's cloth? What if it's plastic? What if it's cardboard? What if it's wood? What if it's metal? Right? Um, all of these different models for um, for robots doing things that humans have had to do so far because judgment is required. Um, to sort of figure out what that is and decide what to do with it, right? Yeah. Um, so there are plenty of robots that can take, you know, very tightly defined problems. You know, you've got a bin full of cogs, all the cogs are the same. You want to take those cogs and you want to put them on a conveyor belt. That's easy, right? It's when you got a bin full of stuff and there's a whole bunch of different things in there that becomes harder. Um, but but it's, you know, you can create a model that says, you know, here's an environment with a bunch of different things in it. The machine vision can tell that it's a bunch of different things. It can create a digital twin of what all those different things are. It can either know or, you know, it either knows or doesn't know what all those, those things are from the database, right? Um, and then it can behave intelligently. So that's the, you know, and so, so Mujin is by far the most successful intelligent robot company in Japan, they've deployed over a thousand intelligent robots um, in Japan and in China. Um, and, you know, now they're now they're cracking open the U.S. Um, uh, stay tuned for a press release to come soon. <laughs> hey, there, there you go, frog plug. So to that to that end, I think just Sorry. quickly kind of a couple of questions that came in as you were talking. Um, one was, 
it was kind of interesting. Uh, Jerome asked, did RFID solve this use case? And, and it's interesting, right? Because there are a lot of use cases which can be solved by, you know, AI that maybe also could be solved from some other, by using some other things that might be cheaper, who knows? Um, Bill, did you, did you have anything you wanted to, to add there on, on, on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it again, that right remember i don't know if you remember we used to think that we were going to be able to put rfid tags on everything right and then we would know where everything is all the time and um unfortunately you know that you know that's just complicated it, so we do have you know there are there are different manufacturers and different retailers um and or different um uh, oems and different vendors you know, negotiate different sort of requirements in that regard, mm -hmm. whether it's RFID or, you know, or barcodes or QR codes or whatever it is for identifying what this is. Um, and you have to deal, you know, and so Mujin has to deal with all of them. So okay. sometimes it's RFID, sometimes it's a barcode, sometimes it's, you know, a QR code, sometimes it's, it's OCR. So it's, you know, it just, it just varies and they've got to deal with all of it. But again, it's not an infinite number of different issues, right? I mean, it's a uh, modelable. Indeed. Right? And I think stepping back from Eugene specifically and looking at another question that came in from Robert, Robert was asking, he said, most of the startups that I see these days all have some component of AI or machine learning in their pitch. Regarding these technologies, what should one look at uh, look for in terms of what AI can achieve for any stakeholder. In other words, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you say that it's it's worth doing this the AI way or the ML using MI using AI or ML to do this? Like, what must it deliver to the stakeholder to be worth doing those things? It's I mean, and uh, sorry to jump in again, but because I I had a recent experience. Um, I was overseas. I was listening to a bunch of pitches, and. Um, and it was like you know, 12 pitches or something. And at the end of it, I noticed nobody said AI. And I thought, oh my <laughs> surely <God."> not. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I, how could it be that, you know, you guys aren't using AI yet? And they said, no, we're all using That's AI. Table stakes. Yeah. yeah. It's like saying we use words, you know? <laughs> yeah. We use code. Yeah. We, right, we use code. It was so interesting to me. That, you know, 12 pitches, uh, you know, I think 10 of the 12, not all of them, but 10 of the 12 companies actually had AI embedded somewhere, um, but none of them mentioned it because, uh, you know, Trisha says, table stakes, table stakes. That examines that. I think that answers the saying the question around security as well. I think we, I think security has become more persuasive, per pervasive now. That's hard to say even. Um, in all the, the tech we do, just because it's in a lot of the platforms we use, you know, just like you're saying, well, everything's got AI in it, well, everything seems to have a little bit of security in it. You know, we've got further to come and there's a lot of things going on. You know, Apple's gone a long way on the consumer side of things where they made a big deal about it. And you can, you know, it's a sellable thing to have security and state that you've got high levels of security. And But then just in all the platforms that all the, all the application developers use, you know, it's all there, right? So it's um, instead of you know, just in the old VPN days, instead of a VPN now, you actually, all the systems are all all um, secured instead. Um, so I think it's just, it's gradually bit by bit. I think it's it's coming into play. So security is definitely uh, higher up the agenda, but I think it's just there by, you know, osmosis as well. Yeah, and I think um, for those of you, I don't know, is everyone following the Q&A um, independently? Or I don't know if you guys are all seeing it. Mark's doing a nice job of, of keeping his eye on it. But um, for those who maybe hadn't, um, what Prakash was saying was that in a lot of industries, security is sort of an afterthought. And the things that, um, that we've talked about so far, he's sort of curious if, if security is being if security being integrated into the core um, presents a hot opportunity. Um, is anybody seeing anything kind of cool with security going on right now in hot areas of security around industrial IoT edge computing? I, I did see a company that was taking the approach that the embedded software was actually a, a you know, a threat vector <laughs> uh, and that that was another, you know, there probably wasn't enough getting done on that side of, you know, the sensors uh, that are going to be deployed uh, in ever increasing numbers. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. It's it is interesting. Back, I don't know, a few years ago, 
um, early day, relatively early days or mid days of IoT. I don't know where the middle is, but um, in terms of IoT of evolution, right? Um, there was this flurry. There was this flurry of of energy around security in devices, and then that propagated to things like um, traffic lights, to things like cars, right? So there was a you know the hackable autonomous vehicle. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Right? Um, the hackable you know a drone, the hackable whatever EV toll, the hackable whatever, right? So everybody. There was a flurry of activity around that, um, and there was a flurry of um, sort of solutions around sort of unhackable IoT OS software, right? Um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, so there's no, there is no vector of hacking, um, presumably. Um, and so there, you know, now I got to admit, I have not either heard of the success of those companies <laughs> or seen a lot of pitches along those lines recently. Um, so, you know, shame on me, but um, I, you know, cause I assume it's still an issue and I assume that everybody, right? I mean, certainly Waymo is not, and an, I might put Tesla in a different category here, but I think Waymo, <laughs> You know, Waymo is not going to ignore the security issue of an autonomous vehicle, right? Um, and then on the healthcare side, um, you know, again, uh, there you got that regulation again. Um, you've got um, in order to play IoT in healthcare, you know, you've got a whole bunch of security issues um, that you've got to comply with. Um, you know, also related to privacy, but, um, uh, and so again, what, there was a movie a few years ago about hacking somebody's pacemaker, um, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I don't, you know, I'm, I, I actually brought that up. I brought that up in a pitch, I don't know, several months ago. Uh, and, and they laughed and they said, no, 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 you can't hack a pacemaker. Yeah, okay, I don't know, <laughs> but um, I thought you can uh, hack anything. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Like, yeah, right. It but, did it in a I movie, so it must be right. The network. Yeah. I don't see why not. Yeah. <laughs> so, Look at us. We all know. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me interrupt here for a few minutes. We'll be only one minute. We are coming to the raffle. We are raffle oh. off these barbecue uh, <laughs> gloves for hot events or for a cold event. Bill, I think you are still good with your sake. Yeah. I'm not, I am not going to raffle this off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought there's a prize so we no. can hold it. With, oh, misunderstanding. Yeah. Anyway, so the prize, uh, one of these nice uh, fairy tales and fairies has uh, picked a number and the name. The name is Mike Demler. He is here. Mike, uh, please send me your email address. Wow, good. Yeah. And also First your question. email address, so we can send you um, the gloves directly to you. And if you use it, please your next barbecue, please uh, send us a picture. Okay, with this, thank you very much from my side. I hand over to uh, Lisa, and we see you soon in one of our next events. Lisa, the floor is yours again. I I, I really appreciate. Um you, Peter, and, and the organizers of, of this event. Uh, congratulations, Mike, by the way, I see you've just uh, entered your enthusiasm into the Q&A. So very excited for you and those barbecue gloves look amazing. Um, but I, uh, if there's any other questions, I think we have another minute or two for questions. But I think um, just to kind of look at the last thing that was mentioned, someone said to Lisa's point, it seems the pandemic has also exposed the remote working model is something that a good portion of our workforce is permanently adopting. Um, it is really interesting to see that push pull um, with regard to at least folks I know, I don't know what you guys are seeing. Um, a lot of people want to stay home. A lot of people want to go in person. And there's that sort of tension, right, of like what people's different comfort levels are. Um, yeah. Have you guys seen anything interesting? Oh, one one second it. again. Mike has raised his hand. Probably you want to say something. I allow him to talk. Mike, you want to say? Mike, you want to unmute yourself and... And, Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey guys. 
Yeah, great, uh, great meeting. I used to attend these in, in person <laughs> back in the day and when I was in Silicon Valley. I, I just wanted to say I just I actually just purchased a smoker a few weeks ago and I'm doing a, a turkey for Thanksgiving. And when I saw those coils, I thought like this is going to be perfect. I did not expect to win it. So thanks a lot. <laughs> the <laughs> the idea is also we come to we will come to your place and look yeah. in person, not on Zoom or picture. You're gonna have how to you get, handle you're the gonna have to hope there's no snow. I'm in Reno now. <laughs> we want pictures though. We want pictures of those gloves being okay. used. Okay, we'll do, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. To answer the uh, question, Elise, I mean, um, yes, uh, definitely, you know, the, the hybrid remote work stuff, but to bring it back to, um, you know, to the wireless side of things, we're seeing a lot of um, no real movement in terms of acquisitions, you know, M&A yet, but a, a lot of noise around, you know, SD-WAN coming back into that whole frame again, software-defined networking, which is, you know, that the folks at home, you know, you've, you've got this connection that's normally a consumer connection and you want to try and use it for business. So you want, you know, you want your traffic prioritized, first of all, you know, Kids come home from school and they start using Netflix. You don't want um, any interruptions there. And also from a resiliency point of view as well, you know, and this will all be funded by the corporates, um, you know, the folks that you're working for as well. It's not like the consumer pays for this, but you want resiliency as well. So you want like a dual access network. So when, uh, here it's, you know, it's either AT&T or Comcast here in the Bay Area. And um, so you probably want to have both of those and then switch between the two and, and also get a boost that way as well. So when you're on a zoom call you know you get boosted onto both networks or something and prioritized or when you're just doing email you just back on one and you can give most of the bandwidth back to the kids to do netflix and stuff and so i think that sort of thing's going to happen and uh, we might see a few a few bit of movements there as well so we're following a company called um adapted networks that's doing that for for smbs i know the big the big guys have made some acquisitions a few years ago but um I think there's a few folks coming now in and doing that just for small businesses, you know, where they can leverage that and have a, more, a much lower cost solution rather than having to pay millions for a solution. That's a, I think that's a genius solution for a lot of us working at home with kids who like to do what they like to do on the internet. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, with that, I think uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions uh, this evening. So thank you guys all so much for, for being a part of this panel. It's always wonderful to talk to you guys and, uh, the organizers at WCA, thank you for all that you do and for, for making this panel possible. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having us, Walter. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you again. And the next WCA, what's not, what's not, will be next year again. And in between, we have at least 11 other events. Yeah. <laughs> thank <laughs> you so much, you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, Trisha, thank you. Bill, Henry, Mark, and we knock on your door also with other things when you come back. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Also, thank, thank you to, so the, to the attendees. and. Yeah, see Great you next seeing time. you guys. Great working Excellent. with you. Lisa, yes. thanks. Trisha, Thank Henry, you, Mark. Yeah. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, Peter. Bye Thank bye. You.